Thank you. Uh, and welcome today, everybody. Thank you. That was a little bit about Khaled's, uh, Khaled's foundation. And good afternoon. My name is Emily Stavro, and I'd like to thank you for joining us today and welcoming Khaled Hosseini to Schuler Books and Music as he finishes up his national book tour. Uh, since this is an event of great magnitude with several areas of overflow throughout the store, I'd like to just go over a few orders of housekeeping to keep things running smoothly before I make my brief introduction. First, if you like today's event and you'd like to be updated on all of the events happening at Schuler Books in the coming months, pick up one of our Pick of the Month newsletters or sign up for our free e-rewards program at SchulerBooks.com. By doing so, not only will you get our monthly events newsletter via email, but also valuable weekly coupons to use in store. I've also put up a sign-up drop box at the head of the book signing line for your convenience should you wish to sign up today. And just a bit about the format of today's event. After my introduction, Haled will take the stage and discuss his new book, and then we'll take some questions from the audience seated within the studio before he starts the book signing. Once Haled has taken the last question from the Q&A, there will be a transition from being seated in the studio to being lined up for the book signing. We ask that everyone in the studio exit the space, and we'll be lining people up in groups. Your tickets have corresponding letters on them. We will line up those with letter A first, here at the doorway where the signing line begins, and we will call over the intercom to line up the next groups in succession. The line will go fairly quickly, so please listen for your group to be called. Uh, and as a courtesy to our speaker and our guests this afternoon, please silence all cell phones and mobile devices if you've got them on you. And I also wanted to thank Peguin Publishing Group for bringing Haled to West Michigan and their continued support of local independent bookshops across the country. And now for the man of the hour. Haled Hosseini was born in Kabul, Afghanistan in 1965. His father was a diplomat in the Afghan Foreign Ministry and his mother taught Farsi and history at the high school in Kabul. In 1976, the Foreign Ministry relocated the Hosseini family to Paris. They were ready to return to Kabul in 1980, but by then their homeland had witnessed a bloody communist coup and the invasion of the Soviet army. The Husseinis sought and were granted political asylum in the United States and in September 1980 moved to California, where Khaled finished his secondary education and continued on to earn a medical degree. In 2001, while practicing medicine, Hosseini began writing his first novel, The Kite Runner. Published by Riverhead Books in 2003, that debut went on to become an international bestseller and beloved classic, sold in at least 70 countries and spending more than 100 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list. In May 2007, his second novel, A Thousand Splendid Sons, debuted at number one on the New York Times bestseller list, bestseller list, remaining in that spot for 15 weeks and nearly an entire year on the list. And today, we have the pleasure of having Haled dis discuss his newest novel, And the Mountains Echoed. It's a tale about how we love, how we take care of one another, and how the choices we make resonate through generations. And this tale revolving around not just parents and children, but brothers and sisters, cousins and caretakers, Hosseini explores the many ways in which families nurture, wound, betray, honor, sacrifice for one another, and how often we are surprised by the actions of those closest to us at the times that matter most. Ladies and gentlemen, a warm round of applause for our featured speaker this afternoon, Haled Hosseini. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can everybody hear me? Yes? A lot of nodding heads. Good. Um, so we have some time together. I thought I would um, introduce the new book, and I would read a little bit from it, and then take questions. You can ask about this book, the previous books about writing, Afghanistan, whatever is on your mind. Um, we'll discuss those things. Um, so what I'd like to do is uh, read uh, briefly from this book. Um, and The Mountains Echoed is, the heart of the book is about um, the relationship between a boy whose name is Abdullah and his sister whose name is Pari. We meet them in the fall of 1952, he's 10, and she's three. And they're living in a small, uh, remote village in Afghanistan. Um, and they're on their way to Kabul uh, with their father. Um, back home, they also live with their father and their stepmother, whose name is Parwana. Um, their mother died giving birth to the, little, to the little girl. So they live with their father and their stepmother, Parwana. And they have a little stepbrother. His name is Iqbal. When we meet them in 1952, uh, winter's around the corner, 
and they've, uh, the family has already suffered through the previous winter, which was really terrible, during which they, uh, they lost uh, one of their babies. So now they're going on the way to Kabul. The, they're crossing a desert, and they're riding in this little, little red wagon that the father is literally pulling across the desert, one of those like, radio flyer wagons. So they're walking to the city where their father ostensibly has found work. Um, but what actually happens in Kabul ends up being very pivotal in the lives of both of these children and ends up having long-term consequences and ripples and echoes across the lives of not only the two children, uh, but also in the lives of a slew of other characters in the book, each of whom gets a chance to tell their perspective, their side of this kind of this one big story. And the story, as it goes on, expands out not only from the village, but to Kabul and eventually goes to Europe and, uh, and ends in the United States. Um, so what I, what I thought I would do is read from early in the book. doesn't require too much setup. Um, and I, it would be about the relationship between the boy um, and his sister, and also about the relationship between the boy, Abdullah, and his stepmother, Parwana. Um, because that, the, the stepmother ends up being pivotal sort of in what happens between the two kids. The he here is uh, Abdullah. He wished he could love his new mother in the same way that he loved his own mother. And perhaps his stepmother, Parwana, he thought, secretly wished the same, that she could love him, the way she did Iqbal, her own one-year-old son, whose face she always kissed, whose every cough and sneeze she fretted over, or the way she had loved her first baby, Omar. She had adored him. But he had died of the cold the winter before last. He was two weeks old. Parwana and father had barely named him. He was one of those three babies that brutal winter had taken in the village. Abdullah remembered Parwana clutching Omar's swaddled little corpse, her fits of grief. He remembered the day they buried him up on the hill, a tiny mount on frozen ground beneath a pewter sky. The mullah saying the prayers the wind spraying grits of snow and ice into everyone's eyes. Abdullah suspected Pawana would be furious later to learn that he had traded his only pair of good shoes for a peacock feather as a gift for his little sister, Pari. Father had labored hard under the sun to pay for the shoes. Pawana would let him have it when she found out. She might even hit him, Abdullah thought. She had struck him a few times before. She had strong, heavy hands from all those years of lifting her invalid sister, Abdullah imagined. And he knew how to swing a broomstick or land a well-aimed slap. But to her credit, Parwana did not seem to derive any satisfaction from hitting him, nor was she incapable of tenderness towards her stepchildren. There was the time she had sewn Pari a silver and green dress from a roll of fabric father had bought from Kabul. The time she had taught Abdullah with surprising patience how to crack two eggs simultaneously without breaking the yolks. And the time she had shown them how to twist and turn husks of corn into little dolls, the way she had with her own sister when they were little. She showed them how to fashion dresses for the dolls out of little torn strips of cloth. But these were gestures, Abdullah knew, acts of duty, drawn from a well fall shallower than the one she reached into for her, her own son, Iqbal. If one house, the house caught fire, Abdullah knew without doubt which child Pawana would grab, rushing out. She would not think twice. In the end, it came down to a simple thing. They weren't her children, he and Pari. Most people loved their own. It couldn't be helped that he and his sister Pari didn't belong to her. They were another woman's leftovers. In the wagon, Abdullah sat behind Pari his back against the wooden slat sides, the little knobs of his sister's spine pressing against his belly and chest bone. As father dragged him forward, Abdullah stared at the sky, the mountains, the rows upon rows of closely packed rounded hills, soft in the distance. He watched his father's back as she pulled him, his head low, his feet kicking up little puffs of red-brown dust. A caravan of Kuchi nomads passed him by, a dusty procession of jingling bells and groaning camels, and a woman with coal-rimmed eyes and hair the color of wheat smiled at Abdullah. Her hair reminded Abdullah of his mother's, and he ached for her all over again, 
for her gentleness, her inborn happiness, her bewilderment at people's cruelty. He remembered her hiccuping laughter and the timid way she sometimes tilted her head. His mother had been delicate, both in stature and nature, a wispy, slim-waisted woman with a puff of hair always spilling from under her scarf. He used to wonder how such a frail little body could house so much joy and so much goodness. It couldn't. It spilled out of her, came pouring out her eyes. Father was different. Father had hardness in him. His eyes looked out on the same world as mothers had and saw only indifference, endless soil, endless toil. Father's world was unsparing. Nothing good came free, even love. You paid for all things, and if you were poor, suffering was your currency. Abdullah looked down at the scabby parting in his little sister's hair, at her narrow wrist hanging over the side of the wagon, and he knew that in the mother's dying, something of her had passed to Paris, something of her cheerful devotion, her guilelessness, her unabashed hopefulness. Paris was the only person in the world who would never, could never hurt him. Some days, Abdullah felt she was the only true family he had. The day's color slowly dissolved into gray and the distant mountain peaks became opaque silhouettes of crouching giants. Earlier in the day, they had passed by several villages, most of them far flung and dusty, just like Chardbach. Small square-shaped homes made of baked mud, sometimes raised into the side of a mountain and sometimes not, ribbons of smoke rising from the roofs, wash lines, women squatting by cooking fires, a few poplar trees, a few chickens, a handful of cows and goats, and always a mosque. The last village they passed sat adjacent to a poppy field where an old man working the pods waved at them. He shouted something Abdullah couldn't hear. Father waved back. Paris said, Abdullah? Yes, he said. When I grow up, will I live with you? Abdullah watched the orange sun dropping low, nudging the horizon. Well, if you want to, but you won't want to. Yes, I will, she said. No, you'll want a house of your own. But we can be neighbors, she said. Yeah, maybe. He won't live far. What if he gets sick of me, he said. She jabbed his side with her elbow. I wouldn't. Abdullah grinned to himself. All right, fine. You'll live close by, right? Yes, he said. Until we're old. Very old, he said. For always. Yes, for always. From the front of the wagon, his sister turned to look at him. Do you promise, Abdullah? For always and always, he said. Later, father picked Petty up on his back, and Abdullah was in the rear, pulling the empty wagon. As they walked, he fell into a thoughtless trance. He was aware only of the rise and fall of his own knees, of the sweat beads trickling down from the edge of his skull cap, Petty's small feet bouncing against father's hips, aware only of the shadow of his father and sister lengthening on the gray desert floor, pulling away from him if he slowed down. So I think I'll stop there. Um, that happens in, uh, as I said, early in, in the fall of 1952. The kids go to Kabul, and, um, and they're, they're torn from each other. They end up becoming separated. Uh, as is kind of evident in this chapter, they're extremely close. Um, the brother and sister, but really it's almost like a parental relationship because Abdullah is really the one who raised his little sister given that their mother died when they were so young. And he's the one who clothed her, who fed her, who walked her, who cleaned her, who held her hand while she learned to walk. And so that separation between the kids end up being extremely traumatic on him. Um, and also it ends up affecting Pari, the little girl, um, in very profound ways as well, although she, doesn't, she won't remember her brother. She won't remember that she had this life. Um, and so for her, the loss of her brother ends up registering with, with in, in more vague but no less powerful ways, ways. And so the separation of the children and the question of whether they will be at some point reunited kind of hangs over the rest of the book and in many ways forms the trunk of this tree uh, that is the book. Um, and as I said, as the book, as it progresses, branches out, and the stepmother gets her moment in the sun as well, Parwana, and she ends up being, 
like many characters in this book, um, more complex than one thought initially. And your first impression of her may not be the, the, the most lasting one. Uh, their uncle, who is really kind of the agent, the catalyst for what happens between the kids, gets his moment in the sun. And, and his, um, the confessional letter that he writes uh, about his role in the children's uh, fate ends up being kind of one of the uh, watershed moments in the book. Um, I think I'll stop there. What I really like doing is, is answering your questions, and we have a chunk of time left. So what I'll do is I'll stop there, and I'll, you can just raise your hand and ask me questions, and I'll point to you, and I'll do my best to answer. <laughs> yes, ma'am. The question is about whether my second book, A Thousand Splendid Sons, will be made into a film. There's been talk of it. Um, the rights to the book have reverted back to me. So the studio that uh, optioned the book never ended up making a film uh, or hiring a director. There is a screenplay out there written by Steve Zalian, who wrote Schindler's List and a number of really great movies. But thus far, what they call the elements in Hollywood, meaning financing and director and so on and so forth, haven't come together. As far as I know, it's still kind of in limbo, so no news on that front. Although I was um, texted by a cousin of mine like three months ago, and he was effusive congratulations, and I was like, what are you congratulating me? He goes, he goes the movie is coming out. I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> so it was um, IMDB lore. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. So many more um, perspectives. I just wondered if there was a reason that you changed the style a little bit, or if you consider it a change in style. Well, the question is about the change, uh, a perceived change in style from my second book to the new one, given that this one branches out. It was really more um, a question of necessity, because um, in A Thousand Splendid Sons, I was really telling the story of these two women, and so the tree really had just two branches. There was a Mariam branch, and there was a Lila branch, and they really kind of came together. But, but with this one, um, I became interested in even more characters. So the branches each then gave off branches of their own. And so I became uh, very, very interested in, in all these other voices whose lives were affected by or connected to somehow to the lives of the children. And, um, and as I went along, I saw that the, the, the book that I was writing could not be contained in a kind of a linear fashion, in a sort of a linear narrative, and I really had to kind of uh, uh, write it as a series of chapters which are connected and which reveal things about the big story as you go along. And each chapter kind of illuminates something that happened in the past. Um, it it's makes for a different reading experience in some, in some way. Uh, in some ways it's similar because it is a very emotional book. And, uh, and, and it's about love, and it's about families, and it's about the bonds between, and strong relationships between people within families, which I think really has been sort of this seminal themes of both of my earlier books. But it's, it, I think it requires a more of an active participation on the part of the reader, I think one way to put it, because you do have to connect dots, and you do have to kind of flip back occasionally and say, who is this guy? Oh yeah, so now I understand. Oh, this is why he said that. So it's a little bit of that kind of you have to be an active participant in the in the in the in, in the putting the putting the story together. Which I I don't know. It's it's certainly my cup of tea because I love those movies. I like those those books where I have to uh, do a lot of the work. Um, so it's uh, it it. I've heard other people say it, it. The book is well served by a second reading as well. So who am I to say no to that? <laughs> <laughs> this lady's had her hand up. Let me quickly. Mm -hmm. um, oh my God, uh, Abdullah. And uh, I don't know how to pronounce it. Is that Mama? Is that Hay Mama? Uh -huh, the, uh, and, um, a, a, a later character. Yes. Am I allowed to talk about that? Well, yes. Uh, yes, but, but, <laughs> yes, but, yes, but, but <laughs> I, my guess is most people haven't read the book. So if we get too oh. much into the nuts and bolts of it, it won't mean much to the audience. And then you and I are going to end up discussing spoilers. <laughs> and then <laughs> everyone, everyone will hate us. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Okay, that sounds good. Yes. Just to capitulate what she said, I, I think the visceral nature of Kite Runner and the visceral nature of um, a Thousand Splendid Sons is <clears throat> certainly worth addressing because I almost appreciated how you took some of that visceralness out of it and allowed it to be an emotional journey and myriad emotional journeys that overlap like a web. And you wanted so desperately for the ending to be 
slightly different in order for the beginning mm -hmm. to have this beautiful trajectory. But knowing you as we do, you're right, <laughs> things don't end necessarily. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> At least I didn't have to rock myself to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I won't try to recreate what you said for maybe not everybody heard, but um, uh, the, the upshot of what this lady very kindly has said is that uh, in some ways this book is um, less likely to just kind of rip the spine from your back and uh, <laughs> be <laughs> such a wounding, gut-wrenching experience. And that's true. Um, you know, that wasn't by design, but it, as I, you know, I never designed my books to be, you know, painful or less painful. It's really just kind of the way the characters unfold and the way the story ends up kind of progressing. Um, I have very little design in mind when I write my books. I never know where they're going to go, uh, so I just kind of write them as I go along, and they more or less just kind of declare themselves. It feels more like discovery rather than, the, rather than creation. Yeah, and so this one turned out to be uh, about characters whose lives and whose dilemmas kind of played out on a very you know, human, intimate, personal level rather than on a kind of a more political, uh, on, on the arena of like, you know, the stuff that they discussed in a Kite Runner and a Thousand Splendid Sons when you had you know, this very oppressive kind of uh, uh, climate and, uh, and people suffering from you know, the oppression of the, uh, the regimes in Afghanistan and so on and so forth. This one kind of took a different path on its own. I don't want to ignore the folks out there, so maybe somebody, that lady right there, yes. Um, my characters, uh, thank you, first of all. Um, I, I don't think it's, it's particularly insightful to say, you know, I, I, ca I can't create my characters out of nothing. Uh, you need some raw material some clay to mold and then add, uh, you know, use your imagination. You need something to start with. And so often there's some element of them that is rooted in some form of reality, something I've heard, seen, overheard, known, experienced. I use myself quite a lot or little bits of um, my past and my life to kind of illustrate points and create characters. <clears throat> I think every writer would tell you that, that they, they must rely on some form of reality because you can't create things out of a vacuum. I, I, do end up, uh, I, I do end up spending a lot of time with my characters. Um, you know, in the course of two years, three years, wh however long, I get to know them very well. And they really change from that first morsel or two that, I ha that I'm molding. They end up becoming much more different by the time I'm, I'm actually in the third, fourth, or fifth draft of, of a book. Um, and there's an internal dialogue going on with them daily, so they become very real to me. They become like real people. And they stay that way. I feel like, I feel very proprietary toward them. Uh, up until the very last comma on the very last copy editing draft, and then when that goes off and the, sort of the advanced review copies come out, then by then, you know, I just, then I just kind of let them go because everybody will read them and then everybody will have their own projection of what these characters look like, what they sound like, and who they really are. So, uh, the lady in the white, yes. Is there a particular place you like to be when you write? Uh, so, um, I, I'll, I'll use that as a kind of a, just a discussion about the, my writing process. I mean, I write from home. I wrote The Kite Runner uh, really early in the morning because I was working a full-time physician then. And so I was working from, uh, you know, 9 to 5. So I woke up at like at 4.30, 5 in the morning and I wrote for three hours and I went off and saw my patients. Um, in December of 2004, I decided to switch. Not, I, it's not correct to switch careers. I decided to take a year off from medicine because I was writing my second book and I wasn't making any progress because I was always at work and this book was more challenging to write. So I, I took a year sabbatical and I began writing in the hours that I write now. I basically write during the day. Um, that second book I wrote mo largely from home but I also rented this kind of a, um, it was maybe half the size of the stage, a kind of a, a glorified cubicle uh, with no windows, no decorations, just a desk. And I wrote there on weekends because my kids were, 
<laughs> Always in my hair. So <laughs> I wrote on weekends there. Nowadays, I write pretty much after I drop off my kids at school till about 2. And then when they're home, I just, you know, I, st I don't work. I don't work physically, although in my head, stuff, stuff's going on all the time, yeah. Um, it's, I need it to be quiet, so I know, I know people who work with music. I, I, I've not been able to do that. I don't outline my day's plan. I don't outline anything, really. I just sit down, and I never end up at 2 o'clock where I thought I was going to end up at 9 o'clock. And my books never, ever, ever go where, <laughs> where I thought they were going to go. So they always end up surprising me as well. My pleasure. Yes, sir. Uh, the question about um, writing from different perspectives and whether it was challenging. In this book, there are nine different perspectives. And so I found that very challenging, and that was maybe the hardest part of writing this book. Because each chapter in this book is more or less self-contained. I mean, it, it sort of can stand on its own, I guess, but not really, because there's so much overlap and so many things that happened before that you kind of have to know in order to really make sense of things. Uh, going back to those connecting fibers between the chapters. But the thing that was really difficult was that in each chapter was a different voice, different worldview, different biases, different background, different level of education, so on and so forth. But also, each chapter had to come to some form of, some form of ending, as it were. You know, in a, in a sort of a, a traditional novel, you know, at the end of one chapter to the next, you can just kind of let it bleed into the next chapter. You don't have to end with any kind of... But with this one, I, I couldn't quite do that. I mean, I, I would start a process, and by the end of the chapter, I had to bring it to some form of resolution. And I find endings very difficult to write. I find beginnings fairly straightforward um, and enjoyable. Endings are hit and miss a lot of times. They're very difficult to write. But this book, I had to write kind of like nine different endings. Uh, each chapter had to end on some, some kind of uh, way that revealed something and didn't just kind of peter out. So um, at least that was the intent, attempt. Whether it was successful or not is up to you guys. Um, so yeah, it was, uh, and it was tough keeping all the, the storylines going at the same time. It was like that act of spinning plates and so on. And it became, the stakes got a little bit higher with each subsequent chapter. Uh, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, well, well can, can we do, um, can we do, can we do five more minutes? Yeah. Um, yes. Um, I, I think there's something, um, the question for those of you back there is about the sort of very painful parts of the book that are very affecting or whether they affect me as well. Um, I think it has to because otherwise it's a little creepy because it's like you have somebody sitting someplace and kind of in a very kind of cynical way, pushing the right buttons to make people outside feel a certain way. And meanwhile, they're kind of sitting there completely unaffected by the whole process. That's kind of unsettling and, uh, and, and it's kind of manipulative. Um, you know, um, I'm not like that at all. Um, you know, I, I, I don't want my books to be like difficult to read or painful to read, but that's, like I say, you know, I don't plan them that way. Um, so whatever happens to the characters, whatever the, my readers feel, I end up feeling tenfold because I've been with them for a long time. I guess the, the sort of the typical example would be the character of Mariam in A Thousand Planet Sons. I, I, really, I really loved her a lot uh, because I felt like I really knew her. I knew women like her in Afghanistan, even from the time that I was a child. These kind of women who were kind of invisible, were wearing a veil and having these, these, um, these unhappy lives. I felt like I really knew who she was. And um, I didn't know how the book was going to end. And as I wrote, and these characters kind of declared themselves more and more, and the story kept unfolding, I kind of began to see that you know, there's really only one way the story can end. And anything outside of that would feel, to me, untruthful um, and unsatisfactory. And so my characters, as much as I love them, they do have to serve the greater purpose of, 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 of being part of a story. And so when her fate kind of became clear to me, you know, that, 
you know, uh, that affected me, you know, writing those final few pages of her life. Those were, uh, you know, emotional, emotional pages to write. So, yes, ma'am. Oh, sorry. Um, the question is about whether I go to Afghanistan and also do I miss my characters when it's done. I'll answer the second one. Um, well, I miss the, I, I do miss being in their world. Uh, you know, I, I do miss the time I spent creating them and, and being with them. I do miss that because there's, there's a great feeling of relief and accomplishment when a book is done. But it's some ways kind of anticlimactic too, in in a weird way, because you you're like, well, that's that's all there is to it, I guess. Now, you know, we go on to the next thing. Is that what happens? Um, so I do miss the creative process and being in those characters' world, and uh, and um, but I am careful not to go back and revisit them too much, because um, like I haven't read the Kite Runner in I think ten years, <laughs> and I haven't read my second book in years also, because then what happens is that you do change as a person. You change as a writer, and then you become very self-critical, and you begin to think about, ah, oh, I should have written this differently. And you, the temptation is to pull out the red pen and constantly self-edit. <laughs> so I, I rather just, um, just leave it be. Um, I do go back, um, although I need to, I do need to go back soon. Um, the last time I went was um, September 2010, but I've gone back a handful of times since the Taliban were run out of town. Um, and my, uh, I guess I should just give a brief impression. My impression is that things are better and things are worse in some ways. Um, from a standpoint of security, things now, the last time I went, were quite different from when I went in 2003. 2003, there was nothing going on. I mean, there were no IEDs, there were no suicide bombings, there was really no insurgency to speak of. I could you know, go anywhere in the, in the city more or less un, un, uh, unperturbed. Um, you could drive around the country, it was relatively safe, and so on and so forth. By now, the story is, you know, I don't have to document for you what's happened um, with the uh, suicide attacks and the return of the Taliban and the insurgency and so on and so forth. But in some ways, it's so much better than it was. When I went in 03, it, was, it looked like a war zone. And there was virtually no electricity. And it, when it was there, it was very sporadic. And the entire neighborhoods were completely demolished. Um, you know, there was very few kids in school and so on and so forth. Hospitals were in terrible shape. People didn't have access to health care. Um, nowadays, things have changed quite a lot in those respects. You know, eight million kids are in school now. There was, it was under a million in 2001. And most of them were boys, and most of them were just getting educated on, on Islam and nothing, not much more. And now you have at least close to three million girls in school, a total of 8 million kids. Um, literacy rates are, are going up quickly. Uh, traditionally, Afghanistan has had literacy rates of between 10 and 30 percent uh, in the countryside and outside of Kabul. By 2025, it's estimated it will be 60. By 2040, it will be 90. Um, people have much more access to health care. The city has just completely been rebuilt. There's infrastructure. There's a lot of, a lot of technology, a lot of telecom, uh, people in the workforce. So in some ways, you know, things are better. But the country has enormous problems. And uh, the next 10 years, I think, are going to be difficult to watch. One more question. Well, this. Um, the question is about whether I'm writing my and thinking uh, the, in English. Or um, so when I uh, when I was a, a boy in Kabul, I wrote in Farsi. I started writing the time I was eight or nine, and I was I would write in Farsi obviously because it's the only language I knew. <clears throat> my family moved to France in 1976 and picked up French within about a year. By the time that we left France, I had started writing some stories in French as well. Arrived in the U.S., I've been in the U.S. now 32 years, and gradually began writing in English as well, and then gradually began writing solely in English. And as the years went by, 
I uh, honed in my head a voice of my own, uh, you know, uh, meaning a prose voice of my own, but a certain, you know, a certain rhythm and a kind of a cadence and a tempo that I recognized as my own. And so now I do write only in English. Um, I, I suppose I could write something in Farsi, but, um, I, and I can read and write Farsi, it, it would be technically correct, but my, but my voice, whatever that is, would be missing from it, and it would be technically correct, but kind of bland and uninteresting. That's my susp suspicion. Um, so I've become very comfortable writing in English, and I don't foresee that changing. Well, it has been a, a pleasure. You guys, um, thank you so much for attending this event. I've been on the road since May 18th. <laughs> I've visited more than uh, 40 cities, and uh, Grand Rapids is my last stop, so I'll be going home tonight. <laughs> and um, thank you. And I, I, I couldn't have asked for a more cozy, intimate, friendly environment, and a very kind and uh, an attentive audience. So thank you all very much.